Good morning, good afternoon. I am Laura Matukaita, Media and Communication Manager at Gero Community. Welcome to today's CC webinar live panel discussion and knowledge sharing session, and thanks for joining. We would like to also thank Iridaeus as our supporting partner for our today's CC webinar live session. For audience, if you have any questions, please do use a chat option throughout the discussion. Also, at the end of the panel discussion, we will have some time aside where you will be able to ask your questions verbally by clicking on the raise hand button and allowing me to unmute you. And now, I would like to invite Eric, CEO at BSC and CC Ambassador to moderate the session and welcome the panelists. Over to you, Eric. Hi, everybody, and thank you for, uh, for, for, uh, for being here and welcome to the CC webinar live session. We're going to talk today about the, the role of data centers and the internet exchanges providers um, uh, in the region and globally, and uh, how to see they um, uh, actually to how they meet the, the future demand. Um, before I'm going into uh, into the panel discussion, I want to welcome uh, and and give just a quick time to, uh, to to all the panelists to quickly introduce themselves. We don't know them yet. So Joshua, over to you. Welcome. Hi, um, hi everyone. This is uh, Joshua uh, from Singapore. So I work for uh, a government statutory board. It's called ASTAR, which is the amalgamation of several research institutions. And I take care of uh, organizations, corporate data centers. So this is what I do. Uh, on, as a side hustle, I judge for DCD. For DCD. Uh, I've also been for some of you, you must know me because I'm also a Okay, thank you very much, Joshua. Um, the lines are uh, a bit spooky, so maybe if we talk a little bit slower, then uh, then I think that everybody knows. Uh, uh, Everybody can hear well. So, Marco, over to you. Welcome. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I'm Marco. I'm from Dekix. Uh, I'm based in Austria. Uh, and uh, for Dekix, I'm responsible for Middle East and South Asia. So, as, as you know, we run internet exchanges all over the world. Um, some just one thing, maybe maybe we unmute ourselves, uh, we mute ourselves while the others are talking because I think we have an echo here, just saying. Correct. Um, so, well, we run internet exchanges all over the world. Um, and uh, as I've said, I am responsible for Middle East and uh, South Asia. And yeah, we had uh, crazy times uh, during the last weeks and I'm happy that we have the chance to talk a little bit and meet at least virtual. So I'm looking forward to today. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, over to the Netherlands. Eric, welcome. Welcome from uh, the Netherlands and uh, hello everyone who is uh, listening in uh, today. I'm, uh, I'm really pleased uh, to be here, although it's not in person but a virtual meeting. Uh, so my name is uh, Erik Verhoef. I'm with uh, NetIX, responsible for sales and uh, business development. Uh, NetIX, in short, is a global service provider of uh, connectivity services, including internet exchange services. And uh, we are available in more than 100 data centers uh, across the world. Uh, and we provide on, on one uh, single port in a data center the, the aggregated traffic of uh, more than 20 internet exchanges, including, uh, for Marco, uh, DGIX, including AMZIX, including LINX, so the main uh, European hubs. It's a distributed layer two access platform. Uh, which makes it very convenient to reach uh, all the traffic and exchange traffic with uh, with thousands of participants uh, just with with one uh, single uh, NetEye export. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, and over to John. John, welcome. Hi, everybody. It's John Pearson here. Um, 
Brit in Amsterdam. So I'm actually in the Netherlands working for a US company called Iron Mountain. Uh, and you would agree with me, Eric. Um, yes, we're a, a global company. We're young in the, in the data center business. We've only been around in data centers for approximately five years. But the whole company has a heritage in data storage of uh, 70 years. So we're leveraging off that data cartridge tape side of the business to, um, to build and set up the, the data center business. So we're now present in the US, EMEA, and also Asia. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, John, and thank you all the panelists um, uh, around the globe actually being here. Uh, and uh, I would like to welcome uh, also from the panelists uh, the, the audience and the participants who are uh, watching us. So welcome everybody, and uh, and hope you uh, uh, you will enjoy this uh, this uh, this webinar live. Uh, so, John, you, you, you just a quick one. You were saying you have a heritage of data storing. I think that goes back to. 1950s, 40s, but yeah, tell yeah. me a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right, Eric. Um, <laughs> you've obviously been listening to some of our conversations from last year, which is good. But um, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, we, we started in storage um, in the 50s, and that was simple storage to start with. You know, everybody had to keep paper storage, so we had a mine, an iron mountain, a mine in there, so we kept stuff there. And that grew into um, analog digital stuff, such as uh, cartridges, tapes. And then a few years ago, um, you know, the question was, well, this is all the analog type of storage. We want to get into digital storage as well. And that's quite naturally meant uh, building and getting in, building data centers and getting into that side of the business. So, you know, this... Uh, we have quite a heritage on, on the other side of the business, 70 years, in fact. Um, and through that, we have, we have uh, 1,400 locations, actually, that we could possibly um, um, use as data centers or, or for storing data. And also, perhaps more importantly, um, 230,000 enterprises with which we are already doing business. I mean, it's 97% of the Fortune 500. So, you know, we, we have all those relationships already and we're capitalizing on those relationships and on those locations for the, um, uh, the launch and, and, and success of the data center side of the business. So we have an analog side and we have a digital side and I'm on the digital side. Okay, sounds fantastic. So through all, throughout the almost 70 years, I mean, you... Uh... You've been uh, transforming and growing with uh, with uh, well, what's what's going around us. So that's, yeah. that's really that's that's really good to see. Yeah. Um, so guys, um, and and maybe uh, Marco, I can uh, I can I can quickly start with you. Um, what are the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic on the regional data centers, and uh, uh, what do you see currently? And and um, and do you think that it impacts, let's say, the growth? What is, what, what's your view on that? Well, uh, um, obviously as an internet exchange, we see the impact on the traffic growth. So just in the first uh, few days of the curfew, and of course with some time difference between the countries, between the internet exchanges we have all over the world, um, we saw a, a dramatic growth. I mean, uh, we had uh, two of our records in Dickix Frankfurt during the curfew. Uh, so we did grow by 10% in Frankfurt. Uh, and if you think it's coming from uh, almost, it was coming from eight plus terabit already. So we uh, uh, did go over to over nine terabit in the meantime. And some of the small internet exchanges grow by 40%. So uh, it was definitely the traffic grow, which we saw, uh, but we also analyzed that the, uh, uh, consumption was different. So you usually have a, um, it's, it's a curve, you know, it's going up and down and you have your peaks and usually in the evening time. So what we saw is that the peak time got longer. So you have uh, definitely, we definitely saw that people are using uh, the, the internet much longer. 
Uh, and so the peak uh, is not only in the evening, it's al already during the day and it's uh, much longer. Something which we really, <laughs> as you ask regional, uh, something very nice which we uncovered now during Ramadan is uh, the evening when uh, people are allowed to st uh, start eating again. Uh, you see a drop, a really dramatic drop in the traffic graphs. <laughs> so um, it's yeah, really... Yeah, yes, obviously. Uh, so it's uh, really interesting uh, uh, what you can see from the traffic. We did a lot of analyzing and obviously video uh, streaming, uh, but also all the video conferencing, everything which conferencing, we had sometimes up to 100% uh, traffic growth. So it was dramatic times for us, really um, interesting uh, with a lot of upgrades and a lot of more traffic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Uh, Eric, on, on your side, did you see the same? And um, maybe, maybe you can broaden it a little, little bit also over to the US. Yeah, we, we saw similar movements in the traffic. We saw a huge increase uh, in our peak traffic in, uh, in March. It grew with uh, more than 20%. And uh, we also uh, saw uh, capacity increases, uh, a huge appetite for content. Uh, video content, online gaming content, um, e-learning, and uh, like Marco also already mentioned, uh, the, the traffic pattern was different. So there was more, uh, a bigger increase uh, of traffic during office hours, which, uh, which makes sense compared to, uh, to normal. Uh, on the other hand, we also saw uh, new projects uh, being put on hold. Uh, some of the companies uh, in the tech industry, they are hurting because of the corona crisis, uh, especially the ones that are in, uh, in mobile and uh, in roaming, uh, that they generate re roaming revenues, so they are really, really hurt. Uh, some of the networks have implemented uh, network uh, freezes. Uh, and it's also generally quite hard um, to expand to new data centers, uh, for example, and open new pops because of the international travel uh, restrictions. So I'm also really curious to learn uh, from, uh, from, the, from the panelists uh, that are in the data center world uh, how they are coping with, uh, with this. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. So so we, uh, we see an uh, enormous growth on, let's say, on the IP level and, and, the, co and, the, and the connectivity and, and, and the growth over there. Now, Joshua uh, from Singapore, um, how do you see, what, what is your take on, let's say, on the, whatever the uh, pandemic actually is, is, uh, is, uh, 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 is having an impact on and especially on the data centers? Um, and, and what is your take on it that that that, that it that it let's say in influenced the uh, the 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 growth and in what way? Sure. Um, uh, interestingly, I had a Zoom call with some friends. Uh, I think about two weeks back, and what I'm hearing from from most of them is that uh, everyone's getting an uptick in terms of demand. So from a de demand perspective, we are all getting more customers. Now that's a good thing, but. I think there's no simple answer to such a complex problem because while there's getting more demand, we're also getting more challenges. I think the biggest challenge is really staffing because a uh, few weeks back, uh, we started to close the borders and a lot of the workers come across the borders to work in the data centers. So that means that we are left with a fraction of the workforce. And then from there, we started having a lockdown, which meant that we had to shave off more people. And now we're working with a very small core team now, interestingly, I read, um, uh, I think there was a report released by CBRE just recently about how they are responding to COVID-19. And in some of the things that they said, they are trying to defer essential activities as far as is possible. They're trying to make it uh, as, as far as they can to avoid people from meeting each other. And we can do that by asking customers not to come here. We can do that by asking teams to work on a team A, team B basis to do some segregation. But by and large, a lot of our M&E works, we need people to be in close proximity. Maintenance works, transformers, UPSs, you can't do it by yourself. So I think there's a challenge. Uh, so I think we're have, we have seeing staffing problems. We are seeing uh, challenges in terms of how we're going to schedule some of the activities like power shutdown, 
maintenance of uh, critical uh, equipment. And I had a, uh, a conversation with a friend who explained that because he's part of the supply chain. Now, if you're an operator, you're happy because you're getting more business. But if you're part of the supply chain, supplying equipment, providing services, uh, due to COVID-19, you might not be able to deliver as per your contractual terms. It mm -hmm. is what it is. Because export's going to be a problem, import's going to be a problem, staffing is going to be a problem. And in, in a case where a lot of activities can no longer take place, that means that some of those in the supply chain, they cannot complete the milestones, which means they cannot get paid. So I think that's a big whammy on those in the supply chain side. Um, and I think that applies not just for equipment, it applies for subsea, it applies for facilities management. So one hand, positive. On the other hand, we're seeing some challenges. Uh, how far are we going to go down that road? We're not sure yet, but uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, uh, from Iron Mountain uh, point of view, uh, how is how's the, the coronavirus pandemic actually um, uh, affecting us? Yeah, affecting us and impacting on, uh, on, on the business. Yeah. Or on the as negative. Joshua just mentioned, you know, there's no simple answer to such a complex problem, really. However, what we see is uh, that those enterprises and companies that started the trans digital transformation programs are continuing with those programs. And sure, there may be some hiccups because some of the there's a, there's a supply chain disruption for their, for their servers or whatever for, for, for a couple of months or, or whatever. But they still, there still is the desire to complete those programs. And what we see actually generally is that there's, there's a slight uptake even in the number of companies and requests that we've had to do with the uh, digital transformation programs because there are some companies out there that actually now are forced to, let's say, go digital, right, and go online. And previously they were not uh, as online, let's say, as, 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 um, as they need to be now. So we see that as a positive. Um, um, you know, people, as Eric Kerberhoof was just saying, you know, the content delivery has grown enormously. Um, everybody's watching movies. Uh, uh, we are using Zoom uh, with I don't know how many people, but um, it's all video. This would not have even really been contemplated like this even, even two months ago. There's many companies doing this. So all of that video content and other content, uh, games, whatever, have to be delivered and they have to be nearer the eyeballs, which I think means um, more focus, let's say, on, on edge, what we call edge data centers, because of, because of the proximity required next to the eyeballs, we have to be closer. So we see that continuing. continuing. Um, we haven't actually seen a, 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 a drop in the business. But you know, as Joshua was mentioning, we do have to be careful how we treat um, our own staff, operations staff, and customers. We obviously, safety is obviously our main, uh, the main requirement. We, we, we can't let people in if we think they're going to be unsafe. So we've, I think everyone has taken steps to ensure that if people do enter, um, safety is paramount and they are safe. We have seen less footfall, let's call it. People are still coming in. People are still maintaining and doing things. Um, but yeah, we've seen less footfall overall. Um, but then we're in a, quite a, a luxurious, let's say, position in the Netherlands because most of the companies that we have, most of the customers we have at the moment, have some engineers already or are able to, to get the expertise required in country. I mean, I know Joshua mentioned that um, international travel has a, a very negative effect, and I can well imagine that. But, you know, we're fortunate enough here to have um, a workforce with those skill sets, and many of our customers also have the workforce with the necessary skill sets. So the international travel issue isn't really as acute as it might be in some other places, such as Singapore. No, absolutely. In general, a positive, you know, uh, I would say a reasonably positive trend, actually, yeah, with, obviously with some limitations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, 
and everybody, I'm, I'm just looking with, with, with my right eye, so for you on the left side, uh, looking on the chat box and see if there are, let's say, some questions coming in and so on. So, um, uh, Eugene, thank you very much for your, for your question. I will, we'll, we'll come to that uh, later. What, it, what effect it will have, let's say, uh, while the, 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 the increase, with the increase of the demand, you know, how it will affect pricing. We'll, we'll go into that later. Carson, thank you so much. Uh, and also for um, uh, telling us that there's a great presentation, you know, um, uh, from last week from uh, from uh, from Ripe. So um, um, one question I want, I want to get into um, uh, is actually um, uh, for Eric, Eric Verhoof, um, and 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 that is actually the the, the, the following. If you see, and Marco, please bump in. If you see that there is, uh, let's say, a 40% increase of traffic on average, that's, that's you know, 50, 50 40, 50%, um, uh, and, and putting it together with, 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 the, with the question from Eugene Pradas from uh, BTC, um, does it will affect, let's say, the, 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 the pricing of the, uh, of the IP? Is it, is it going down? Eric, Marco? Well, at the moment, there's no uh, no change now. But what we did uh, offer our uh, our customers that want that were in need of a capacity upgrade uh, quick uh, and and soon, and they wanted to have it delivered now. That we just uh, give these upgrades uh, for free. Uh, there was actually. Um, of an e-learning platform in uh, Bulgaria, which is uh, used by 100,000 of students in uh, Bulgaria. I hope I pronounce it correctly. It's called Ucha uh, Se. So for my Bulgarian friends who are watching, uh, I hope I, uh, I said it correctly. But uh, they were in need of a capacity upgrade uh, over the weekend because they had to go live before uh, Monday when the schools were uh, reopening and uh, thousands of Bulgarian students were actually depending on it uh, because they had to uh, take their lessons uh, from home. And uh, we managed to upgrade them uh, in time over the weekend and, uh, and they were, of course, very happy with, uh, with the service uh, that we provided to them. But for the longer term, if it uh, will affect the pricing, uh, probably yes. If, if the, the level of uh, usage of uh, internet exchange services uh, uh, is getting higher, that means that we will also be able to uh, uh, to lower the pricing uh, per Mbit. But um, that would naturally come at, um, if, if the level stays uh, as high as it is right now. Mm -hmm. Marco? So yeah, I mean, we, we have that naturally built in in the pricing system anyway. So uh, if you take more uh, your price per megabit goes down uh, by definition. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's natural. Uh, when uh, the, the demand grows, the price per megabit is going down by definition. A one gig port is more expensive per megabit than a 10 gig port and a 100 gig port. Or if you take 400 gig, it's even more uh, cheaper on uh, per megabit. So this is natural and um, uh, 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 and I, I wouldn't say that the uh, COVID situation did here any change here. It's just uh, what we always did. Um, what I can confirm is uh, I like I like uh, Eric's example of the uh, e-learning platform is that uh, basically we had this also a lot of upgrades overnight. Uh, so it's uh, this time was really crazy in terms of upgrades overnight for customers. But also, even uh, as you can think of, if you have the, 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 the overall demand growing on an internet exchange in a week, as you have planned for the whole year, um, you even have to do it on the on-site, in the data centers, doing upgrades. So this was a very, um, for us, a very adventurous story in some countries uh, to do needed upgrades, to do needed backhaul upgrades with the issue that you can't go in with uh, stuff uh, and so on. So this was very, very uh, uh, crazy, I would even say. On the long run, um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not 
I'm skeptical how it will turn out on the long run because we also see obviously internet providers, they have an increasing demand on traffic, bandwidth and so on. But what we don't know is uh, how the effect will be from the economy because uh, I mean, we even had that uh, in one country where the ISPs were coming and said, okay, our government said, we can't uh, do anything if customers stop paying us. Uh, so we will need to discuss how we can handle that situation together. So as an internet exchange, of course, we have limited options how we can help. We can help you on the port, but we are not the data center and so on. So we will see how this will turn out. Um, I think on the short run, it was a crazy business for some of the operators could increase. Um, uh, 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 and uh, also, of course, increased demand. So for us, it was uh, really as an internet exchange, if you just look at this, it was very, yeah, it was, uh, we had a lot of positive effects on the, on the traffic side, but we will see how it will turn out in the long run. And this is something where I'm, I'm very curious uh, to see also the difference between the countries and the developments mm -hmm. there. Okay, Joshua in, uh, in uh, Asia and Singapore, so um, do you see any, any price drop after, after, after the increase or is it just, guys, let's keep it stable for now and, uh, and uh, we're looking at it? Or do you have similar models uh, where you say that, let's say, in the data center and IXP environment that, uh, that, that, that let's say, pricing is, is adjusting to the, to, to the market demand? No, I think because uh, we've all been caught our pants down, so the prices will take some time to adjust. But slowly but surely, I think the train is coming. That's the best, the lousiest excuse I ever heard. <laughs> you can always drop your prices. You can also pick, take them up. Please continue, uh, Josh. Okay. But I, I think the challenge would be that uh, on one hand, um, where there's a burst of fire, naturally, uh, all the operators, they are glad to take on the business. And but on the other hand, we have to, we have to admit that the cost of running operations has increased significantly as well. So right. I think it's reasonable that the prices will have to adjust. But bearing in mind that a lot of the, the contracts are long-term contracts. So just because I, my cost of operations has increased yesterday, I can't increase, increase my prices today. But then again, I think uh, based on some of how the contracts have been structured, yes, some of them have the flexibility to pass on the cost. But I don't think it's immediate. Um, and that's why we're not seeing it immediately but i do believe that it will have to increase mm -hmm. okay john yeah um pricing i mean we we don't intend to adjust pricing uh, because of covid or any other reason i mean the business our business has to be sustainable um and, and our customers businesses have to be sustainable and it's no good dropping prices to help customers if at the end of the day, you're gonna go out of business yourself. I mean, it's as simple as that. So, and there's a, there's a cost. I mean, this, this business, uh, and I'm sure Joshua will agree, is, a, is, a, is an extremely capital intensive business. I mean, you need hundreds of millions to build data centers, you know, and it's based on a business case and it's based on getting a, a return within a, a, a finite time, otherwise you can't borrow the money so that, that means that you don't have enormous degrees of freedom with um, um, price reduction. Of course, um, in the long term, I mean, there are ways, there are ways you can um, improve price structures by making sure you have a, a good cost structure. And that is really through standardization of everything, right? Mm -hmm. so, I mean, that's where you win. If you make everything standard, wherever you build a new data center, if it's all exactly the same, then you know, there are some economies of scale there, which enable you to pass the cost savings on into your price. But I mean, apart from that, um, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you, you have to be able to make, it's a business, you have to be able to make money to sustain it. And so we don't see immediately any, any reason uh, this year, certainly, uh, to, 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 to reduce prices. Okay, and, and so, 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 so how do you um, uh, think that, that, that the data center uh, landscape uh, is, is looking today? And do, do you foresee any changes, maybe also to, uh, due to the pandemic, but 
I mean, you're quite a solid yeah, I you mean, know, we, thing. We're, yeah, we're a sticky service. You know, I mean, it's difficult. Um, you don't, you don't, if you're a customer, you don't want to be moving data center every six or 12 months, right? So we're a sticky service. So, so that also comes into play. Um, and I think Joshua mentioned, you know, these are long-term contracts. I mean, some, some customers are looking now at five years or 10 years or well, five to 10 years. And then, then you've got room to play a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you look at the average term, which is, um, which is something like three years, um, I would say the higher degree of uncertainty, the less you are really able to do, to play around with price simply because of the degree of uncertainty. So I don't, I don't really see the pricing models changing that dramatically in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. Okay. A uh, question from John Sargo, because this uh, came in and maybe I can stay with you and then, then, then move to, to, to Josh. Um, what impact will the future deployment of enterprises moving their services into the cloud uh, have on the data centers? Uh, it depends on what type of data center you are. I mean, if you're just if you're just co-location, it might affect you negatively. If you're uh, if you're also for, if you're also looking at the hyperscale market and able to serve that market, then you will pick up. I mean, the difference is that instead of having the enterprise directly as a customer, you'll have an Amazon or a Google or, or Microsoft as your customer. Right. So that's the only. That's what we see already. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll 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 pick that end user up one way or the other. Yeah, but you have to be able to to position yourself and to be able to build the data centers, either for a hyperscaler or for you know a wholesaler or for retail. You have to cover yeah. these three segments. Unfortunately, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good, Josh. Right. Um. My my own take is that there are different segments with different dynamics. I think the hyperscalers are not just looking at geography. They're looking at uh, very well crafted contracts. So naturally, they're looking for something that best suits their needs, and they will take take it on a certain direction. I think they're also good, there's also going to be the SME markets, at least in my part of the world, and they will continue to need data centers. They will continue to need uh, co-location. And the good thing being, after the last few months where we're all working from home, the behavior of consumers, the behavior of enterprises have changed. It, it was an unwilling change, but they have changed. So now they have no excuse but to move toward digitalization, transformation. They have no choice but to put things on the cloud and on co-location. They will figure out that it's best to do it with someone else who knows what they're doing. Now, having said so, SMEs will take on a certain direction. They will need certain types of contracts for it. The hyperscalers, which may take a hall, which may take a campus, I think they'll take it in a different direction. So I think you have different triggers pulling it in very different directions, and that's why we will see a, a huge spectrum. So I think there will be co-location providers who can meet certain markets. There will be certain co-location markets, uh, co-location providers who can meet the the big needs as well. So I think there's enough, uh, shall we say, there's enough wine for everyone in the party. That's that's my mm -hmm. own take. Okay, thank you. Talking about enough wine in the in the in the uh, uh, let's say on the party, um, Marco. What role do, do, do the internet exchanges and, and peering actually um, uh, play and uh, to help actually to generate new values and, and to drive to growth to, 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 to maximize revenues? What is, what is your take on that? Um, well, we, we, we had a discussion last year in Oman, basically, Correct. Uh, yeah. when um, uh, we talked about what, where we see the future. Um, uh, of the industry, especially for the internet exchange industry, obviously, but uh, internet exchange is an aggregator, basically. Internet exchange is an aggregator for all the ISPs, for the operators. Uh, it is also the the one, thi uh, one thing uh, which helps the data center to get the business in. So um, if you ask me which, what role we play and which role we play even more in future, I, I see this, uh, that we are more and more interconnection platform, not just peering platform. Uh, basically, just think about Frankfurt. In Frankfurt, we have now more than 900 networks connected to the platform. And these networks 
basically an internet exchange exchange the IP traffic, but we have all the cloud operators connected. So we made them available with our direct cloud product. Uh, and first people were looking at us and asking, what are you doing? Are you becoming a carrier or what, or what is your business here? Uh, uh, and we enabled virtual v, uh, PNIs between the uh, uh, different parties there. Um, so, but then um, all the participants saw the, the, the positive effect for them uh, in terms of business, you know. Uh, if you uh, can easily interconnect in Frankfurt, you're coming from Bulgaria and you can easily interconnect with somebody from Mongolia or from Africa or uh, so from uh, South Africa or from Egypt or anywhere in the world uh, in order to do business with each other, then uh, this is the real strength what an internet exchange can bring. And meanwhile, we rolled this out to almost all locations all over the world. So, and we see, uh, and I would see the COVID-19 is maybe uh, just speeding things up now. Uh, especially when it comes to cloud and cloud connect. So we see a huge demand now for this. Yeah, we will uh, absolutely that, that trend. Eric? Yes. Do you see the same? Yeah, I, I see what Marco is saying I, I, along the same lines. Uh, I think internet exchanges will continue to play a vital role in the connectivity uh, uh, ecosystem as it's just uh, a very efficient way to plug into a multitude of services uh, and to connect with, with hundreds of other uh, networks with just uh, one port and uh, one cross connect. Uh, uh, Eric, ima imagine a world without internet exchanges and you would have to set up hundreds of bilateral agreements with each and every network and order uh, a cross connect for each of them and manage these connections. It would be a total mess and very inconvenient. So uh, internet exchanges are very important and, and definitely here to stay. And I think also their role is changing. Eh? Internet exchange points, like Marco said, they used to be just a hub, just a, a traffic aggregation point. But uh, nowadays, um, internet exchanges uh, like DigX and also NetIX uh, are offering much more than that. They offer value-added services, they offer access to the cloud, uh, they offer security uh, services, uh, black holing, um, DDoS, anti-DDoS uh, solutions. Uh, they serve as a marketplace where uh, members and participants can buy and sell services from each other. So uh, there are really a lot of innovative services that um, internet exchange points are starting to offer to their members. Uh, in order to stay uh, relevant also uh, for the future. Okay. Um, John, are these guys helping you with your business? I mean, Marco and Eric, are they, all, uh, are they supporting your business? Yeah. Or is it the other way around? On the, on the, yes. I mean, Xs are incredibly important for our business. I mean, uh, uh, data centers aren't just data centers anymore. They're, they're global connectivity platforms is a very grandiose um, term. But actually, you know, you know, you can't be a data center with one or two carriers in there that's going to take you to the rest of the world. You have uh, an enormous customer base with uh, completely different requirements, both uh, technically, geographically, administratively, and uh, having uh, an internet platform, a, 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 a large internet platform as well, I would say, in your facility, or several of them, in fact, is, uh, is a huge advantage because it means your customers, your customers, um, and some of them are quite large, they're global customers, can go you know, anywhere in the world, quite literally. And um, without that magnet, they would not be attracted to your DC or DCs. I mean, they can be in, obviously, in several of your data centers. I mean, we've got uh, IXs in our data centers in, in the States and in Europe and in, and in Singapore. And it's important that, you know, they are in all, all of those data centers, you know, because they can connect internally, they can connect globally, and they can take our customers wherever they want to go. So, yeah, they are helping us enormously. Okay, I, I, I understand this, but, but 
are there and and maybe that, that that's that, that's more for Marco or for, for for Eric as well and 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 Josh and uh, and, and John jump in please. Um, is there any let's say example of of let's say um, uh, exploring together actually new services? Is, is there is something which is on my mind? Well, if I, if I can answer that first and then give the others a chance, a very simple level. Um, yes, I mean take cloud connectivity. Most Xs can do that for you. So if you have an X platform or access to it in your data center, a customer can come and say, yeah, I want to, I want cloud connectivity to, you know, one of the big three or whoever. And uh, you're through the eight, through the X you're able to provide that. So yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Marco, Eric. <clears throat> yeah. No, well, I, I Okay. Yeah, Eric, you first. <laughs> no worries. <Okay>, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, partnerships are very important in this in this industry. Uh, we all work together. Uh, as NetIX, we work very closely with a lot of data centers in the world. Uh, we work together with uh, with IP transit providers, with other carriers, uh, with CDNs, uh, the other internet exchange points. Uh, we basically, for example, um, there are quite a lot of Asian networks nowadays that are looking to expand into, uh, into Europe. And uh, what they basically are looking for is a total package. They, need, they want uh, some space, they need some power in a data center. They want to be able to connect to the main hubs in uh, Europe. They need some IP transit. And uh, what we have done basically is partner with everyone so we can offer this, we can offer them this complete package of uh, co-location and connectivity and, uh, and IP transit and everything they need to, uh, to set up their, uh, uh, their expansion uh, into Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marco? So, um, by the way, I was just reading a question on the chat, which might fit to that. Uh, what exactly. The, what's the panelists that, take on new entrants uh, to the colo and cloud market? Um, so basically, um, as an internet exchange, it also depends a little bit on the background, what you are able to do. I mean, in terms of DKIX, uh, you have to know that DKIX in the end of the day, it is owned by the ECO association. It's the association of, uh, uh, uh the ISVs. Uh, so still DKIX is a commercial company and we have, uh, uh, pretty much freedom how far we can go with an internet exchange and do what is logic. But still, of course, we are not a, a, a typical carrier who would do everything, uh, which is possible because there's an internet exchange. Um, and you can see this. I mean, Netix is different as a commercial company uh, 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 and is doing a great, great job uh, uh, with what they do and how they can combine this. So, but as a, as a, let's say as a more traditional internet exchange, we have some boundaries. But having said that, uh, we invented a lot of things and we are also driven by our customer demand, obviously. I mean, I gave you once the example of this uh, 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 car manufacturing cluster. So you can do as um, basically everything which is syncable, where you need interconnection uh, across data center boundaries, across even metro boundaries. Uh, just there is no, um, there are not many companies who can offer you 30 data centers inside Frankfurt connected to each other as we can do because of that's the job of the internet exchange. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're carrier neutral, uh, and if you think about this kind, everything which where you need such connectivity, where you need no boundaries in the connectivity, uh, an internet exchange can possibly jump in, but not becoming a carrier ultimately in the end of the day. So this, this is maybe the boundary which, which we have. And coming back to the question, um, how can we support new entrants? Yeah, well, that's exactly the, something we are interested. Uh, we are not only interested to help the big, uh, well-known OTTs, well-known cloud providers, um, um, so if there is a German cloud provider, uh, then, well, um, we would be the first, uh, who can offer that on interconnectivity, which this, uh, cloud provider needs. Um, uh, uh, so we have a highly interest, uh, in the end of the day, and this is what we are built for, uh, to help the local economy the local internet economy. Uh, this is 
in the end of the day, uh, why an internet exchange exists in a city, why it was invented, basically. And this is uh, what drives us in the end of the day. And, and, and uh, I mean, you were mentioning the question and the question, uh, everybody, came actually from uh, Carsten Schiefner, and, and thank you for your, for, for your valuable question. Is that actually uh, uh, the Swartz family, so, so Lidl, actually, which, which we all know, is actually moving into the, into the cloud services? Um, but what, from a regulation point of view, and, and, and uh, let's say the, the uh, data security, uh, to put this, let's say, in, 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 in non-German, respectively, non-EU cloud services providers' hands, um, what, what does it mean? What does it mean? And maybe, John, you can, or Joshua, you can, you can pop in as well, but... Um, maybe let me share um, my point of view. I, I had a conversation with uh, a particular provider and they are, they are quite new to the game, at, mm -hmm. at least in my part of the world. A new entrant. Yes, precisely. And my question to them would be, why are you doing this? I mean, naturally, it's to make money, but this is not your bread and butter. There's, there's so much executional risk, exit risk. Uh, there are so many unknowns. And, and I think the point they made to me is, because they want to survive. And, and that's what data centers are about. It's about survival, it's about making a profit. We are not social enterprises. We're not here to talk about PUE. We're not here to better the nation. If we could do that, that's a surplus. But businesses need to find ways to make money. They need to find ways to bring value to the stakeholders. And I think a lot of in, institutional investors realize that despite the, the vast risk, despite the huge capital costs, despite all the things they need to pass through the hurdle in order to do this, it is worth the gamble, it is worth the pain, and that's why we're all in this game. And I think it's only natural that uh, even for those who are new to the game, because they see that uh, this is uh, a market that will continue to grow, especially, I, th I think, in, in, in Asia Pacific. Because mm. imagine in some countries where you have 200 million in the population in one particular country, and half of them are not on the internet yet. So you don't get the, the sort of boom that we've seen in the mature markets many years back because they're moving from one state of industrialization to another state or moving from non-internet to internet. And if you don't catch that wave, it's not gonna come in, I don't know, in another century or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, um, linking this a little bit to, to let's say cloud storage and, 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 yeah, and security uh, and so on, What's our Mountain? Uh, how is our Mountain, let's say, um, uh, supporting their, their customers or the, the demands of the new entrants? Did, how do you see this? Yeah, I mean, um, well, we're trying to, you know, obviously, we try and help them uh, position uh, and, and geographically. I mean, a lot of customers that we're targeting are, are um, in various regions, not just the US, not just EMEA, not just uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. so, and help them with that. But I think there are other ways to, to help them. I mean, um, I mean, I agree totally with what Joshua has just said. Um, but it goes, I mean, there was a question also about partnering uh, a short while ago, I think. Yep. And it comes back to how, do you, how can you really help some of your customers? Now, some of these customers um, are new entrants. You know, they want to be seen not just as green these days everybody wants everybody's green right but they want to the sustainability uh, and they want to be able to demonstrate and express to the outside world that they are sustainable right that they can um, um, contribute in some way to 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 um, the, the benefit to to the benefits of, of of the people by reducing carbon footprint for example right that's mm -hmm. one so that's how we help them. I mean, we try to, uh, you know, because we're 100% uh, renewable, we try to pass the benefits of that on to, uh, to our customers and, so, and give them what's called carbon credits. So this is a way we try and help uh, customers and, and, and bring new customers on board. And mm -hmm. the, some of them are very you know, highly appreciative of, of that approach. You know, because we are, as Joshua said, we're a data center. We're in it to make business, to, to make money. We have to be sustained. It's a long-term business, right? I mean, you don't go to a data center for a few months. You go for a few years, usually. 
and we have to be there. We have to make sure we are there for our customers in a few years' time. So we have to be able to provide an environment in which uh, we're able to make money and, mm -hmm. and build out the next set of data centers for our customers. But also at the same time, giving them some benefits. And this is one small way, perhaps, in which we can do that. Mm -hmm. Talking about this and bridging this, this, this is actually a little bit back to, to, to partnering what, what we mentioned before, because there's an interesting question that came in from Lydia Steffenhagen. And thank you for that, uh, Lydia, for, being, uh, for, for, for helping us here and keeping the panel alive. Um, so she was mentioning that, that as the data centers, they noticed actually that, that the data centers, they, they start to partner with each other and, and uh, mostly for geo redundancy. Uh, is it becoming a, a trend around the world? Is it regionally in, in Asia, in Europe? Um, uh, John, yeah. staying with you, can, yeah. can you elaborate yeah, a little bit of that? Joshua, maybe Joshua wants to add to that later. I think, I think it depends a little bit on which region. Um, I would say partnering, yes, if you're not. The, I mean, there are customers that want, you know, geography. That is to say, you know, more than one region. And some data center companies are not able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, every data center company has every site available, has every location available. But um, that's one side of it. But I would like to just you know, move to the other side, which is m and A. I I mean, what you also see, right, to um, not to counter this, but to perhaps support this idea, is the number of uh, mergers and acquisitions that have happened over the last year or two. The latest, I think, I don't know the latest because it's happening every day, but the, perhaps the most talked about being the acquisition by digital realty, realty of, uh, of European interaction. So, yes, I mean, that's not a partnership in the true sense of the partnership word. I mean, that's a, that's a merger and an acquisition. So that's what I see uh, has been happening. And I, I think that will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. to happen in the future. Yes. Okay. Joshua? Right. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that um, I believe there was an article on, on Wired uh, that, that suggests that either you have more data centers or you have more subsea cables. In fact, I think it's about subsea cables, data centers, and domestic fiber. And, and I think that's the challenge because in many places, it's a, it's a good environment to build data centers simply because you have the infrastructure, you have the demand, you have the supply, you have the ecosystem in place. But there are many pockets where you either don't have the demand, hence you can't do it, you don't have the supply, hence you can't create the supply chain. And most importantly, you don't have the interconnectivity. So by and large, we are beholden to where are the landing stations and, and where are the metropolis, because that's where you can get uh, the talent, you can get the funds, you can get uh, all the vendors to support you. Um, but my guess is that post COVID-19, things are going to be very different and we have to wait and see uh, how the dust is going to settle. How do you see this actually going, going into this topic? Now, in, now in a submatic topic, now you mentioned it, uh, Joshua. Um, what do you think we can expect, let's say post COVID-19? I think a lot of people and especially the audience uh, who are, who are and attendees who are listening to us and watching us are, okay, guys, what will go, what's going to happen? Sure. Uh, maybe let me just start the ball rolling then. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to share a view. It might not be popular, uh, but again, it's a point of view. I, I think there are some who are going to thrive and some are going to die because we're in a war. It's a war of attrition. So while, yes, in general, many operators are breaking in the money. The clouds are at bursting capacity. Good for them. I'm happy for them if they're my friends. But having said so, I'm sure that there are some who are caught in between. They can neither benefit from the surplus, from the burst of demand. At the same time, they are overwhelmed by the challenges. So I think there will be some who would not survive the winter. I'm not just talking about data centers. I'm talking about the supply chain. It could be on the subsea side. You could be on the the, the manufacturer side, you could be the partners, you could be the consultancies. There's a huge ecosystem and many subsystems. Some of them will not survive. That's my take. And for those who do survive uh, because they are nimble or because they have enough fat to outlast the, the bad effects, 
post COVID nineteen, whoever is left behind will get to benefit because then there will be the pent up demand. So I think what's important is we have to learn to conserve our energy. We have to learn to live with the Fed, and hopefully, once we outlast this period, when the uptick is 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 there, we can benefit from that wave. But in the meanwhile, I think there will be some who need to figure out why they're here. Because mm-hmm. if they cannot survive for the next two weeks or the next two months, then they're not going to think about the next ten years or twenty years. So that's my take, and I I wish and I hope that uh, moving forward, because in the past we were able to get away with being disconnected with each other, but moving forward, in order for us to tap on the opportunities, perhaps we need to be more interconnected. I'm not referring to subsea cables. I'm referring to alliances. I'm referring to ecosystems, partnerships, talking to each other, uh, and not just within the industry, but industry, academia, government, and the enterprises, the consumers. Because ultimately, we are doing this for the consumers. If you talk to Alibaba Cloud or if you talk to AWS, in their literature, they always tell you that they are customer obsessed. So mm-hmm. once there is a new use case, they jump into it. When Satellite as a service becomes uh, popular. They jump into it because they are customer obsessed. They see that customers are willing to pay for it, and they are able to do a good job of it. So I think post COVID nineteen, uh, those who can pay, may it may be a different different clientele altogether. And I think mm-hmm. we have to contend with the edge use case as well, because while we are talking about cloud, I think we are now very familiar with the, the narrative of. What are the merits of the cloud? So let's not go there. But moving forward, where there's going to be five G, and again, five G is beholden to domestic fiber. So for mm-hmm. those who claim that five G will grow, but if there's no domestic fiber, that use case is not just not going to flow. So I think mm-hmm. by saying so, that limits uh, the which are the places where you're going to see a proliferation of five G use cases and they're able to monetize it. For those few countries. I think the edge use use case is going to be a lot stronger. So how can data center operators move into that space? Because then it becomes another line of business. Mm-hmm. It's just like when Azure says, "I can provide Azure on the cloud," but in fact, I can pro- provide Azure on premise as well. So they pivoted. They actually created a new service offering just for that, and maybe that's why they uh, prematurely decided to cancel all the M- MCSE uh, certification track that's been ongoing for more than ten years. Of course, they've uh, you know they've taken back the words and said we are not going to do it in, in June. We are going to let it uh, run till I think end of the year. But that suggests to me that even they recognize that there's not going to be an MCSC engineer needed anymore. If you're going to run a Microsoft operating system, it's likely going to be an Azure instance on premise or on the cloud. Mm-hmm. So if the clouds okay. are, are changing the way they think. If the customers are changing the way they're going to think, then I think it's it's incumbent upon us to to think about how can we move at pace with them. But of course, I, I I recognize that the devil's in the details. Okay, Eric, um, how do you see the future going on uh, in in uh, in the IX land landscape? Uh, what do you expect? Post COVID nineteen, uh, yeah. If the question is, are we going back to uh, to normal? To what we used to, I think what we see happening now is is basically a, a rapid acceleration of of trends and developments that uh, that were which was taking. coming anyway, which was it coming, was coming anyway. anyway. It it just has accelerated. So, for example, uh, working from home, people were already doing that, but now it's becoming more normal, and that will probably stay that way. Also, uh, online education, online conferences, like we're doing today. This is probably here to stay because it, it, it works well and it's much less expensive to do it online than, than, all the, than all this traveling. And is all this traveling really necessary? So the, these technologies that were already there, uh, but we really made a big leap forwards and, um, in the use of these technologies. And I think... This is really this new way of living is really going to uh, to stay uh, wherever it is efficient to do so. Uh, of course, uh, personal touch will still be needed, and uh, it's still the preferred way. Of course, we can't move everything in our lives uh, online, 
And uh, of course, I also I do hope that the next time uh, we will convene and uh, and have a panel discussion like this, uh, we would be able to have it uh, in person and really look each other in the eye and have an audience in front of us. But uh, on the other hand, I also don't see us moving back to the old world of sometimes uh, going to a meeting, uh, going uh, driving in your car for two hours, sitting in a traffic jam just for a one hour uh, meeting and then go back in the traffic jam uh, to two and a half hours for a meeting that could have been done just as efficient or probably even more efficient uh, uh, online. Uh, so I think we will be much more careful and much more cautious when it comes to is it really necessary to travel or can't, can we do our meetings uh, online? So that will definitely uh, be here to stay. So I think we will see less international travel and uh, more of these uh, meetings taking place uh, virtually uh, online in the future as well. Okay, thank you. So um, um, being more, more selective is actually, actually the, 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 the key word and that, let's say, uh, the, the, the whole situation nowadays, which, we, which we're living in, that the pandemic actually accelerated, let's say, um, uh, actually the market a bit. Marco, do you see, uh, do, do you see the same as, um, uh, for, and do you predict for the future the same as, uh, as Eric does? Um, the question is, uh, what do I hope and what do I believe, maybe? Um, Both. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> probably in, 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 in the attendee. Well, I, 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 would, I would hope that we all take the chance and uh, uh, use that crisis to change a few things. Um, but I believe it will also depend uh, on ourselves to remind us always, because I know, I mean, uh, we are human. So I think for some while we, we might be, forget. we, we might be a forget. little, a little bit more selective in traveling until it gets inflational already again. Uh, so, um, and then we say, oh, I, I, I'm stressed because of too much traveling. So, and maybe then we, we remind ourselves to the COVID situation uh, where we were all be grounded and it was not so entirely bad, at least for those who could work from home and had no worries about their jobs uh, and uh, income. So I think for all of us who had the, the benefit of this and maybe with a little garden, uh, it was uh, actually not a bad time. Um, and I hope we can remember that uh, in a couple of years when we are going to each and every co conference and think uh, and, and, and believe we must go somewhere, fly 12 hours for a two hours meeting. Um, but we will see, we will see. Um, what, uh, the other thing what I believe is post COVID um, is maybe maybe it is uh, yeah I don't think we will see so many new things maybe just more things got clearer um, uh, talk about partnership we had this discussion before I think partnership in telecommunication was always there it uh, telecommunication doesn't work without any part without partnership telecommunication is built on partnership that's why we have that conferences and uh, but maybe it is a good reminder to all of us uh, in this situation how much we depend on partners and that we should treat them all well uh, I think that's uh, so if we want to have a takeaway from COVID, then uh, yeah, be more aware, be more in, uh, uh, aware of what we have, how we build it, and that we only uh, uh, can work as one. And it doesn't matter if one is sitting in Singapore and one is sitting in, in Amsterdam and one is sitting somewhere in the garden, as I see it with you, Eric, or near to the garden. It doesn't matter. We all uh, have to work together, get along and uh, treat each other well. And our industry and the situation should teach us that way. Okay. That's my <laughs> takeaway from COVID. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, embrace what we have and, uh, and respect what we do. That's yeah, what exactly. Okay. And, they, and especially respect your partners and your customers and treat them as partners. I think that's even more, was even more important than uh, let's take that take away for the future. Yeah, well, because what we do see and um, uh, is as well that, that business, uh, even within, let's say, our telco landscape and uh, especially also as well on the, on the wholesale side, 
on, on the IXP, they see the, they see the business going through the roof, as was mentioned at the start. And uh, on the mobile, the roaming is collapsing 90%. Yeah. So, um, so for every business model there is within the same industry, uh, it, is, it, it can be fantastic, it can be hard, and therefore partnerships and, 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 and the search for intelligent solutions and services, uh, especially within the partnering uh, um, uh, environment and landscape within the telco, uh, will be and remain very, very important. That, that's my that's my take on this one. But um, uh, and, and I would like to thank, let's say, everybody for for, for their questions um, uh, during this uh, uh, during this webinar live. Um, uh, and I see that we're roughly running out of the time. But but um, uh, John, please, do you have some famous last words? What do we have to look for? How do you see it and what after, let's say, post-COVID-19, what can we expect? I think, well, I think um, it's, all, it's already been said by the panelists, but if I, had to, if I had to put that in a nutshell, I would say that um, COVID has, yeah, it's accelerated the shift to online. Online, whatever, online education, online retail, or whatever, right? It's accelerated that. And um, as all the panelists have, have pointed out, that's going to be beneficial to some players and it's going to kill others. And we don't really know how that is going to, who is going to be affected positively or negatively by that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's going to be a shakeout this year, I think, the coming year. Uh, not all bad, not all bad, you know, but um, what's it like after COVID? Yeah, you tell me. I mean, what and what does after COVID actually mean? Does anyone even know? Is uh, it a new re reality actually we're in now? Well, exactly, you know, I mean, um, um, people are talking about travel and uh, I've just seen some comments and questions on, on international travel. I think that in the end, uh, people still do business with people. But I think, uh, as the panel were pointing out, those unnecessary traffic jams of two hours, they can go. Uh, but perhaps the, um, you know, the, uh, those big conferences maybe, or, or the international travel, let's say, to get the big deal in or whatever, or the big partnership, or to keep the relationship, that's, that will probably still be there, I think. And, so, and I do hope so, and, and I absolutely do hope so, because, me, because it's, it's, it's not only, I, I take it for granted that I, that I have to travel, because I would like to see and interact, and more than only once for that one meeting, but also, you know, to, I would almost say just, just, just to, you know, yeah. to be in a vibrant environment, and, and, and where, where, where we all share the same, let's say, um, interest, especially in the on on the on the business side, to see each other, to meet each other, to to talk to each other, to mm -hmm. learn, um, to share, and uh, and I think therefore those uh, those uh, those uh, those platforms, those, those congress will remain there. Maybe not as many as we had before, and people will go. Let's say select a little bit more where they're going, but they certainly are there, and and they're, they're mm -hmm. here to say. And me, as a as a carry community ambassador, of course. Well, what else can I say? And the GCCM is here to stay already for more than 30 years, um, uh, of course. But, but, but personally, and I've been in the business for, I mean, John, as long as you are probably, almost 30 years. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. No, but, it, but it's true. I mean, uh, uh, we see dips coming up and down, eco economic, uh, economic crises, uh, if it's the euro crisis, if it's a financial crisis, whatever. We go up and down. Um, I, I think it's a catalyzator, the, 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 the COVID-19, as Eric uh, mm. uh, correctly mentioned. Uh, and we see it all moving in, in those directions. And I guess mm. that um, uh, uh, on, the, on the IXPs and on the IXs, actually, and the, and the data center and, and everything which is around the cloud, the cloud services, the big data, and, and, and so on, um, first of all, will remain. Uh, will will grow bigger. We what mm -hmm. can we do without that? Nothing. We and plus of that, we need more quality. We need even more quality. So you know, and innovation will be will be asked a lot. So, John, last thing before we go. 
What do you say? Okay, well, you know, this sounds a bit cliche, but I, I, I really hope that the next time we all meet, we, we can actually all meet in person because we're all going to be here. We're all going to be here. Mm-hmm. Right? We're all making major contributions regardless of, of, of the COVID situation. Uh, you could say we're making even bigger contributions now, right? But despite all that, you know, I hope sincerely that uh, next time we can all uh, meet each other in Berlin or wherever it is. I really do hope so. So that's my take on this. With all what this... We plan the end of August. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's my take on it. You know, despite all the, all the advances in the technology and the contributions people are making, let's all please get together as soon as we can. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, John. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, uh, let's say all the attendees uh, which were there. Thank you for your questions. I hope you found it a bit interesting from, uh, from, from the guys and, and, and the experts uh, who, which were my panelists uh, today. I would like to thank you, Joshua from Singapore. John, probably somewhere in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Eric as well in the Netherlands. And, and Marco uh, from Austria. Um, I would say thank you very much for, for being on the panel. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your, and, and our, uh, and your ideas actually in this current situation and what we, uh, uh, and, and how does the business look like uh, uh, within our sub-matter um, uh, expertise. And uh, with these uh, last words, for me, it's ciao for now and I'll give, give back to, uh, to, to Laura in uh, headquarters Berlin. So guys, thank you very much. Attendees, thank you very much and I hope to see you soon next yeah. time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. See you in Berlin in August. Hopefully. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, they are all we are at the end of this discussion. And I would like to thank Eric for moderating the panel, the panelists for joining and sharing their knowledge. Also, thank you all audience for participating and listening. We are looking forward to welcome you at our next webinar session planned for June and our future webinars. Please visit our event portal for more information. This panel will be soon available on our CC Media portal and webinar live page in recording recording format for you to watch it. Uh, If you're interested to support and sponsor our future webinars, please contact CC team. And I wish you all a good health and stay safe. 